Okay, once again, I just want to say thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you for the Talman, for having the Divas here. I mean, it's such an exciting space to be in. Um, and they just, they've never looked better. I mean, with all of the light and all times of day, and um, I'm just really thrilled and that they're gonna be here for a nice amount of time and that everyone can enjoy them. I really feel like I'm a steward of the costumes in a sense. Um, as you know, they came from New York City Opera and um, I'm very fortunate to have had uh, that relationship and um, turn them into sculptures. And, um, but I do you know, wanna make sure that I, that I do thank those due and um, thank you Joanne Casulo for all of your support, your generous support for making this happen and um, I love you. And, um, and Cindy Peterson and Carl Willers. And um, I really also want to express true thanks to the installation crew that made it happen. Sort of death divine heights, you know. Um, and that's not an easy task and it's not something everyone does every day, right? You know? Okay, so. All right, so the story I'm going to tell is um, how the costumes went from that warehouse image you see, um, which was 30,000 square feet with three racks high of clothing, to the promenade space at Lincoln Center. So you can see in that space is about 120 long and about 60 feet high and, oh, look, there's actually, there's a layering happening here. <laughs> Wait, I see my next slide is on top of this slide. This is montage. Montage, okay, well now hopefully, all right, so that's what I wanna tell you. Um, and what I wanna tell you also is when I was invited by New York City Opera to do this incredible collaboration, um, I didn't know a lot about opera. In fact, I was listening and listening very intently to music that was like punk rock and like feminist bands and counterculture and everything that was unrefined. It was all about that. And um, so uh, uh, these are some of the bands that I was listening to. And so I certainly felt like a fish out of water. I mean, I, I'm not an opera expert by any means, but I am very passionate. Um, that soprano we just heard, I mean, tears to my eyes, so incredible. Um, so just to say that, you know, you don't have to know about opera to appreciate. Um, so I do want to start with um, some work that I did leading up to Divas Ascending. And um, the little short, short story is that um, there was a time in the early, late, late 90s, 1990s, um, where there was this spread in New York Magazine that was with uh, a lot of celebrated women artists at the time, but it was all about them and their handbags. And I thought, wow, is that what it takes to get a spread in New York Times about women artists? It made me so mad. And I thought about, look, we're all, look at that, they're, they're, it's layering, okay. Um, so I thought to myself, well, what's like the, the basic, the most basic kind of fashion, female fashion, and I just want to blow it up. So I started with the little black party dress, and, um, and that's what I did. And so this is called Black Bombshell. <laughs> um, and from Black Bombshell, I thought, well, what is truly the most iconic dress? Like, what is the one? And um, there was this show, uh, where featuring Marilyn Monroe in um, at MoMA at the time, it was on buses everywhere. You saw her and a, another fragment of this, um, her with the white dress. And I thought, it's been over 50 years. Why is this the, you know, why does this still have so much agency? Um, and I just love this billboard because I didn't write that, but um, <laughs> I would have. So here it is, like this is the image. This has been called in film like the most iconic image ever. And that is a little bit upsetting because it still continues to this day to be the most incredible, like recognizable image. 
And it is a beautiful image, but like, look at the guy in his neck, just like staring. <laughs> the good part is she seems like she's getting some relief, which is great. <laughs> but he is like, I mean, oh, I don't want him staring at me. So um, anyway, so I had this dress reproduced at twice the scale of Marilyn Rowe's dress, original dress, and I blew that one up. And I called that one Bombshell. Um, I really wanted it to be ecstatic. I wanted it to be about the energy from inside radiating out. I wanted it to be attached to the floor and the ceiling. And, and with, you can see some of the, those spots are hardware. I'll, I'll show you some details later, but um, really oversized hardware, oversized um, fishing line. I wanted it to really be rooted to the floor and the ceiling to sort of like, this is the standard that we're living in. And I want to explode that standard. Uh, and so I did another one where I took another sort of iconic dress of a red sequin dress that I had made. And I had it made to a male physique of someone who was 6'6", six, six, um, thinking that who wears a red sequin dress? I mean, we know a red sequin dress, we, you know, but it's really something that's more of like a drag queen would wear. And in any case, I wanted to blow that up and I wanted to make it into the form of a tornado because I wanted to think about it in terms of natural forces that have the power to make change. And then I did a sci-fi version with a silver sequin dress. This dress is by the famous designer Steven Sprouse, who is known for his punk uptown downtown fashions, and he happened to be a friend of mine. He gave me this dress anyway. I knew exactly what I wanted to do with it after he gave it to me in a Ziploc bag, by the way. And um, it's two mirrored stainless steel discs and with the lines in the hardware, and it creates this infinity column. So the idea is that you know, the female energy could escape through infinity. And then, bride fight. So, um, what happens when there's two brides in a room, I guess, you know? It's, like a, it's a TV show. Um, this is before the TV show, it's a little embarrassing, but in any case, it has to do with anxiety about bridal culture. I mean, it's this one day, and it has all to do with um, the clothing, the look, the accessories. And in here, oh, I think we're doing another double again. Uh, I, I'm not very good at operating this. Okay, so it has um, all the accessories in it. Maybe you can see like the shoes and the pearls and the gloves and the hairpiece up there. And it happened to be, um, cited, this is at the Lever House in New York City on Park Avenue, which is sited right across the street from a very famous church, St. Bartholomew, where you know, the fancy people get married. And um, this was happening during the spring, sort of actually during bridal season. And it was really fun to be just hanging out in the window and watching people walk by and just be like, <laughs> it's like, oh my God, you know, and because all these, you know, weddings are happening and how extreme they are. This is a detail just to show you how I, I, I anchor the work to the floor and the ceiling with the turnbuckles, this piece of vertical metal and twisting, for the tension, and the tension is really one of the materials I think of. It's, I think of tension as a art material in all of my work. It's, um, it's a force, but it, nothing can be without this tension on, on the pieces. And what I'm trying to do is show the kind of, the kind of power and force it takes to tear up or to dissolve these cliches in, in our culture. And um, with a little bit of sense of humor, but um, that's why the oversized hardware is important is as like a real emphasis. It's sort of like punctuating the architecture where the architecture is the frame and this is the punctuation. And here's another piece. Um, all right, so back to the warehouse. Um, so I explained this was a very large warehouse, and I spent, um, I spent 
about two weeks, combing through with wardrobe directors and just trying to make sense of this. I didn't have a pre-imagined idea. Um, I started pulling out things that just kind of stuck out. And it turned out the things that I was attracted to were the things that were built in a way that were so special. And of course, those are the ones that are like the main characters. And they, um, they happen to be the female characters. Um, and I would say, well, who would wear this? And they'd say, oh, that's Mimi from La Boheme. Like, and the dress is so stiff, it's like it could almost stand up on itself. And the truth is, in the opera, she dies embraced with her lover in the snow of tuberculosis. And the dress is constructed in such a way that it is even so rigid. And it was that kind of idea that went through as I found different costumes. This is um, just to show you the scale of the space that was the original commissioned location. And um, I just want to say it was, it was interesting because we, I was invited to do like, they said like, what's your wildest dream? And, uh, but by the way, you can't screw to the ceiling. You can't screw into the floor. And everything needs to be smaller than the passenger elevator, which is like six feet tall. So the rings of the pieces are six feet diameter. And um, I'll show you later like how they, how, how they work. But um, I just wanted to give you a sense of what it was like. So as I'm um, trolling through the the archive, I'm coming across all kinds of things I've never heard of before. Um, like this rack that's called the Romantic Peasant Rack. <laughs> and then how about Distressed Peasant? Like what is that for? Who's a distressed peasant? Like this is a, it's a standard in opera. Um, and who is it? It's Cinderella. Okay, that makes sense to me. Um, makes sense to me. Um, and this dress is one of my favorites in the whole show. She's out there. This is the Distress Cindy. And this dress tells you so much about the level of quality and the, um, that goes into the garments that are couture beyond couture. This dress, the skirt that looks like burlap, is the finest merino wool cashmere mix. And the, the bodice is silk velvet. The interior of it is lined with like a paisley silk fabric, brocade. And then the shirt is linen with hand crocheted lace. And then it's got shoe polish all over it and Sharpie marker to sort of like show up the details. And um, it's just this kind of high-low thing and made me understand too like the, the the preciousness of the costumes where the soprano or the actor or the performer, they need, they, you know, this is like at the finest opera house. This is, um, this one was at, um, yeah, Royal Opera House, Covent Gardens. Um, you can see that's the, the brocade uh, paisley underneath. Um, so, and in many of these costumes, you can see the provenance by these tags. Um, and that will have the name of the production, the soprano, et cetera. So there's all this information just like continually archived in the costumes, you know, who wore it and then they have to sort of probably itches, you know, if you're wearing it and someone else had worn it before, you've got like their history there. Um, uh, this is now in the uh, archive itself, we decided just to build them there um, my studio wasn't quite big enough to do 14 sculptures. Um, and this is an image you can see in the front is the princess part of the Cinderella, the princess side. And so here is Cindy, it, uh, you know, animated. Carmen, one of my favorites. And um, I'm going to just read you, I've written um, very short paragraph about each of the sculptures, but they are kind of an insight to my, my interest in the stories of the, of the works and, and how I'm sort of, I'm changing the narrative a little bit. I was very 
upset about how every, all the women die. And they always die for the wrong reason. <laughs> and it just was enraging. Um, and so my goal, the overall goal for me was like, how do we get her to live forever? Because, I mean, and how to get her out of the archive, how to get her like into heaven so she's like there forever. Um, Carmen by um, the composer Bizet. One of the most notorious women in opera, Carmen, doesn't let anything stand in the way of what she wants whether she's seducing a guard to let her out of jail or romancing the bullfighter, Carmen embodies the dangerous gypsy woman that continues to invoke fascination and fear today. In this sculpture, the gold fabric of Carmen's Spanish-style gypsy dress appears tough as armor, glinting between ruffles of black polka dot tulle. The dress is pulled in all directions, so it appears puffed out and spiky like a blowfish. Here, it is Carmen, not Don Jose, who wields the bloody knife. She warned him from the beginning that love is a rebellious bird. That's from La Habanero. Um, and she only stayed true to her word. So here I have rearranged um, the, the story in this where I have, she has the bloody knife as opposed to the knife that she gets stabbed by the jealous lover. And that um, was wonderful to hear tonight uh, by that wonderful soprano, Carmen being so enraged and confused. Like, I told you, I'm not, you cannot domesticate me, you know, and, and he kills her anyway. But not here. She lives on with the knife. And um, one of the things we did was we tried on some of the costumes. So. This is a wonderful uh, volunteer, and we just wanted to see how the fabric flows and just outside, sort of playing around to see what it looks like alive. And, uh, and here she is here at the Taubman with wonderful light around her. Here's a, underneath her. There's Violetta from La Traviata. And um, I will read her story, um, the operas by Verdi, La Traviata. This is, this is Violetta, the character. Violetta Valerie is a courtesan living, in the, living the high life in Paris. When she meets Alfredo Germont, although she sparkles like champagne in a room full of people, her love for Alfredo shows a yearning for true love and a simple life. Of course, in opera, things are not that easy. She is forced to hurt herself and the man she loves to make his, his family happy. Violetta's gown has been transformed, broken in half, its lining torn out, but the prim, lacy dress and the bones of the cage of the crinoline remain, a floating spectral tribute to Violetta's strength of character and her desire to live a true life. So, you can sort of see the bodice is detached from the bottom of the skirt. And uh, here, just to show you, this is you know, what she looks like pre-animation <laughs> pre and her, her cage. Um, and uh, what I thought interesting as I kept looking, you know, working with the dresses, is that the cage of the hoop skirts were somewhat reminiscent to me of rocket boosters. I mean, tell me that's not so different. It's the Saturn rocket nozzle. Here's the Saturn V rocket boosters that went to the moon. And um, there's something about this that um, feels like I want, I want them to accelerate like that. I want them to go to the moon if they want to. I want them to be able to go wherever they want and in their, you know, their own force. This is uh, Violetta again. Here is Menon. And um, let me see if I read this Menon. Menon. I call this one the ghost angel. It's by the composer Massenet. Full of life and fascinated with all things that sparkle, Menon Lescaut 
is a naive 16-year-old girl who uses her charms to make her way in the world. She puts her own rise to fame and fortune before her love for De Griot, ultimately winning fame and even infamy, but losing the man she loves. Here, the billowing golden gown worn by Beverly Sills, uh, you know, most famous American soprano, uh, in the role of Manon is transformed to highlight the costume's gossamer silhouette, its weightless sweep assuming the form of an angel. Cited in, uh, yes, so this is Beverly Sills in that same dress. It is that dress. And um, I pulled out all the crinoline that was under there. We got some nice press for that piece. It, uh, um, and here is Mimi from La Boheme. And I call this one Mimi Rigor Mortis. <laughs> La Boheme by Puccini. They call her Mimi, but her name is Lucia or so this young bohemian girl tells us when she meets the poet Rodolfo and falls in love with him. Mimi loves to watch the sun rise on the rooftops of Paris and keep her hands warm in the fur muff that Rodolfo buys for her. But when pe a pesky cough turns into something more serious, she gives up her hopes of happiness and dies in the freezing cold in the arms of her love. This exquisite example of bustled Victorian dress in a red velvet is laced bodice sat with satin ribbon is so architecturally constructed it practically stands on its own. The figure of the under unyielding dress hover like a headless sleepwalking zombie and seem frozen in a moment as she reaches for her man. This dress was worn by Renata Scotti. Here she is, the Taubman. Here she is, and this is a night photo at New York City Opera, and I love this picture because it looks like she's doing a blast off. <laughs> um, okay. Oops. Now here, how do I make this one happen? Oh, so this is an example of how it folds and packs, and that was uh, a wonderful, innovation by the prop masters at uh, New York City Opera who helped me figure out this thing of how are we gonna get these, you know, we wanna make a huge installation, how are we gonna get through a six foot elevator? That's how it works. And that's how the silver lining is that it's able to be here and travel. Here is the Merry Widow. And she is, it's an operetta, I believe, technically, by Lahar. As a wealthy new widow, Hanna Glorari is the most sought after woman in Ponte Verdo. However, this charming young woman only has eyes for an old flame who refuses to be caught. Through her charming allure and her slight bending of the truth, she wins back the heart and trust of her former beau. Upside down, her dress functions as a goblet or a reservoir for her fortune, which many men seek. Her petticoat is lined with gold lame, and her arms flex in exasperation. You can sort of see the, the gold lame, you know, when you're up on the stairs and you look down. You can definitely kind of see, see the money. And here she is in the warehouse while we're working on her. And I love this picture. <laughs> and here she is at Taubman. And here is one of the more difficult sculptures to figure out, which was I had to put in Don Giovanni. You know, with all these women, we had to put in some bad man. And um, so I asked the wardrobe directors, like, what does he wear? Like, who is that character? Like, what's his standard? And they'd be like, well, he's usually wearing something dark or, you know, he might be wearing a hat, maybe not. And then I thought, and we came across these gloves that were, fur lined with feathers coming out at the end of black. I was like, who wore those? Like, that's probably Don Giovanni. I was like, that's exactly what it is. He's the groper. <laughs> and so I called this the skirt chaser. Don Giovanni by Mozart. Although there are plenty of villains in opera, 
none other than Don Giovanni could earn the distinction of being dragged down to hell for his evil deeds. Although he's a seducer of thousands of women, a free spirit, and the epitome of entitlement, Don Giovanni is too charming to hate and ultimately irresistible to women and audiences through the centuries. In this sculpture, Don's black fur-lined embroidered gloves thrust towards the crotchless bloomers from above and below a single crinoline made with as many layers of frills as Giovanni's fabled conquests. So there's many, many crinolines in there and um, there is something true about the crotchless bloomers. One of the things I, I learned while I was in this sort of residency in the opera is that there's crotchless bloomers. When you're wearing a hoop skirt with like all of this fabric around, you need crotchless bloomers. <laughs> and here, this is sort of the inspiration of, of him being the groper. And here we are, back at the Taubman. <laughs> 